Guten Abend schon mal an die, die schon da sind. Wir warten noch ein bisschen, dass sich alle Audiosignale verbinden und lassen auch noch die noch Zutretenden ein. Also keine Sorge, wenn Sie eine Minute länger brauchen. Guten Abend, herzlich willkommen zum Transatlantic Tuesday des karl schurz -Hauses. Mein Name ist René Freudenthal aus dem Programm des Deutsch-Amerikanischen Instituts und ich begleite Sie heute Abend durch den Abend mit Jenny Ophill und ihrem Roman Weather, zu Deutsch betitelt Wetter und druckfrisch erschienen im Piper Verlag. Kurz zur Technik. Lassen Sie Ihre Mikrofone bitte ausgeschaltet, damit die Audioqualität nicht leidet. Sie können am Ende auch noch ein paar Fragen in den Chat tippen, wenn Sie was besonders interessiert. Ganz kurz zum Buch und zur Autorin. Es ist der Roman der Stunde, Stichwort COP26. Keine amerikanische Autorin kann den Klimawandel als aktuelle Lebenswirklichkeit, als apokalyptisches Zukunftsszenario so leichtfüßig und lebensklug in eine trickreiche, traumwandlerisch sichere Erzählung von den Albträumen und Traumata unserer Gegenwart verwandeln, wie es Jenny O'Phil mit Wetter gelungen ist. Ihr drittes Buch, ein stimmungsvolles Sittengemälde einer verunsicherten und unsicheren Epoche, voll skeptischem Humor, Finalist für den Women's Prize for Fiction, stellt uns die frenetisch gefeierte, viel imitierte, niemals erreichte Schriftstellerin heute Abend vor. Im Mittelpunkt von Wetter steht die Bibliothekarin Lizzie Benson, die von einer erfolgreichen Podcasterin, ihrer früheren Mentorin, beauftragt wird, die Fanpost zum Thema Klimakrise zu beantworten. Bald gesellen sich Prepper, Prediger, Klimawandelleugner und besorgte Mütter zu den anderen privaten Sorgenkindern dieser Erzählerin, die sich durch Amerikas Malaise in den späten Trump-Jahren kämpfen muss. Das richtige Buch für das Ende der Welt, sagte die Los Angeles Times über dieses Buch. Ganz kurz noch zu Jenny O'Phill. Sie lebt in New York, unterrichtet kreatives Schreiben am Bard College, schreibt Kurzgeschichten, Kinderbücher, Artikel für die Washington Post und wurde für Amt für Mutmaßung, Department of Speculation ist der Originaltitel, mit dem Alan Divine Award ausgezeichnet. Die New York Times setzte das Buch auf ihre berühmte 10 Best Books of 2014 Liste. Und damit, I am delighted to speak to you tonight, Jenny Ophill. Thank you for having me. So I have actually a distinct memory uh, of when I first read your third wonderful novel, Weather, which deals with climate anxiety uh, as well as with many other things. Um, it, it is quite a time ago because it took a bit before it came out in Germany. Uh, I was on a high-speed train to Amsterdam, of all places, on the day before New Year's Day into 2020. Oh. <laughs> This strikes me with hindsight as a pretty appropriate <laughs> setting for it because Amsterdam is in the Netherlands, the first country in Europe which will sink into the sea if current trends prevail. And also it was my last trip before the pandemic hit uh, into another country. Mm. And so your book has, has gotten this kind of visionary glow, I think, in the past almost two years because it pointed out so many interconnectednesses between humans and between humans and nature. And experts, of course, have framed the pandemic as kind of a trial run for what's in store with climate change. So how does your frame of reference to the book evolve still? Is it still evolving? Has it changed since you wrote the book, since the pandemic hit? How do you feel about it now? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, the book came out in February. Um, uh, the year of the pandemic. So I did a little bit of um, traveling around before the pandemic hit. And what was really interesting was, um, I of course had no idea that um, that was what was gonna happen. It wasn't kind of on my dread list per se, but um, it, as soon as it began to, to unfold in America, it had these kind of uncanny qualities because it was a disaster being predicted by scientists. And it was basically a disaster being predicted by math, uh, which, is, which is also similar. And um, what I found was that the amount of disaster psychology I had read for this book prepared me a little bit for the fact that people were going to bitterly hold on to the idea of normalcy long past when um, 
it could conceivably happen. Mm. So I've actually read that you read a lot of disaster psychology for this book, which strikes me as a hard thing to do on oneself. Um, and I thought about how we try to deal with COVID. Um, we try to come up with practical measures, wash your hands, keep your distance, wear a mask, hope it someday ends. <laughs> and trying to deal with climate change like could follow a similar recipe in a way, like trying to come up with practical measures. That's what the COP26 summit was all about, basically. Mm -hmm. And still there's this weird sense of failure, of coming up short, of not really being as practical as we should be about this and just like trying to go back into our caves basically at the end of the day. Um, so do you think this has more to do with this expectation of hopelessness, of unavoidability of climate change, of climate disaster maybe, um, or is it more a thing of a powerless individual, like one person cannot do much against climate change, of course, um, and this like seemingly timid, large, slow collective, which just doesn't come up with much as mm. a large body. Well, I mean, I think that w when we're thinking about climate change, um, and also I think in the, the worst of the pandemic, which as we know is still kind of um, unfolding, um, it can be very hard to think about it directly. Um, in the same way that human beings are not particularly good at thinking about their own death. Um, thinking about what might happen to our planet and what is already um, going on is very hard, I think, for people to kind of take in and then at the same time they have their regular lives to live. So what I was trying to capture in the novel is this constant toggling um, back and forth between like registers, you know, the register of your everyday life where you might be taking care of kids or, or parents, or you might be uh, assisting your neighbors or something. Um, and then this bigger question of like, what is our responsibility to the greater world? And um, are we selfish jerks if we don't, <laughs> if we don't consider that too amidst everything else? And the novel is a little bit about what it means to be someone who is already a caretaker already looking after many people and then begins to extend that view a bit to other parts of the world and also to non-human parts of the world. Um, so that that's where I'd leave that. I mean, in terms of the COP26, um, I think that the same, you know, hubris that led us to where we are now in the climate crisis, the sense that we can have these extractive economies and we can um, never pay a price for it. I think that it's the same hubris now is really hoping for a big solution, like a sort of deus ex machina to come down and whether it's carbon capture, et cetera. And I, I think it's actually gonna be a lot of small things that, that get us through um, more locally. And that's somehow not as, it doesn't wipe away the despair as easily as the imagining of a big sort of solution. Yeah. So you have um, explained in an interview, I've read uh, about how your writing style in this book, short passages, lots of space around the passages, of course, witty and often elusive, aphoristic language maybe, also reflects on how, how our brains handle this, this kind of uh, predicament. And you've mentioned that already, this constant friction between our banal daily life and what we have to do every day and whom we have to take care of and so on and so on, and pondering like big existential questions. And, and it's this constant like jumping around between different playgrounds basically. Um, could you, maybe explain a little bit about how you came to this style and if it, if it um, changed from the previous novel, which is more concerned with private problems maybe, like not like of the narrator, not of yourself. Right, right. Um, well, I think that I did know that I wanted this novel to be facing outwards more. Um, Department of Speculation is a really interior book. Um, I was also interested in that one about like, what does it mean to think certain things are trivial and certain things are important. Um, 
And one of the ideas that I'm kind of exploring in weather is, are we, um, do we always know what, what matters and what is going to turn out to matter? For years, um, I think most environmentally conscious people were sold a sort of personal consumer view of what you should do. If you recycled, if you've changed your light bulbs, um, then you could sort of check that box and feel like a good person. Um, but so much of that was actually, um, there was a very large disinformation machine um, that had a interest in us not believing in anything collective, you know, in thinking that it's all, Americans are particularly prone to believing that things, um, that it's your fault uh, if anything goes wrong in your life. And it's also completely to your glory if things go well. I think in a way that um, European countries often have a, a better sense of like how collective things might work. Um, but in terms of the style, I just felt like I wanted to register in a way that wasn't like Twitter, <laughs> um, which I'm not on, but I wanted to register that feeling of uh, a sort of ambient dread that we're feeling that are, is coming in and that is in the background and everything. And then the need to sort of jump out of that and have something funny or have something that is a daily joy or a daily problem. And so I was trying to create that feeling in the book. And at the time that I wrote it, most books that talked about climate um, were very much kind of in the post-apocalyptic mode. So I was just thinking, what if it's now? Um, and it's that mix, the sort of half ruined world. Yeah, that's that's funny because I wanted to talk about that as well because there's more and more fiction like eco fiction dealing with um, climate change. There's actually been like a big debate in the biggest German weekly newspaper about why Germany doesn't have as much climate fiction yet because of course we had this whole summer of floods and so everybody wanted books about it and there weren't nonfiction and uh, nobody has written them yet. And the American ones often like lean towards the dystopian apocalyptic there's like a few utopian outliers actually i think um mm -hmm. and a lot of it is water world basically <laughs> yeah exactly i may be allowed this 90s reference and your approach stands out so much i think because it's uh, set in this immediate mundane daily present connected to the mess of politics today which feels so hopeless often um, connected to the masses in our own lives, um, which we produce constantly. <laughs> so I wonder if you think your novel is a pre-apocalyptic novel or is it just more of a private one about climate change? Well, I did, I did sort of feel when I was writing it, like that felt like a fun term, pre-apocalyptic. Like if people were asking me what I was writing, I would say, oh, it's a pre-apocalyptic novel. <laughs> I do feel like there's a way in which strange as this sounds, um, writing things after the apocalypse can sometimes let us off the hook, right? If we are imagining that we're gonna be in this world that we're all just fighting off cannibals and um, you know, looking for the last can of Coca-Cola left in the, on the road somewhere. Um, I think that, that that allows us to believe like it will be all or nothing. Um, and I think that what's really hard about the climate crisis is that it's these kind of rolling disasters. They're terrible, like you had the floods this summer in Germany and it's, and the world's eyes kind of turn to that or, or the right before the pandemic, the fires in Australia, but then it bounces off of that. Like it, the people who are not living in that place then stop thinking about it um, until it comes to land on them. And so I just felt like I wanted to, I wanted to take in what it meant to me to become more aware of this. And sometimes little things would, would get through that made it in the book. Like I live somewhere where, where there's apple orchards and it's very you know beautiful on the apples. And I just remember my friend who's a, 
environmentalists just said one day, like, oh, yeah, no more apples soon. <laughs> apples need frost. Yeah. And it was just the no more apples soon that we are also have in our mind at the same time that we're going to a supermarket full of plenty and picking from 10 different kinds of it. Um, I feel like that cognitive dissonance, you know, is, is, is really interesting to me. Yeah. Your writing uh, in this and also in the previous book has, has actually gotten quite famous, I think, for this um, sense of having taken out all of the filler, basically of, for concentrating, essentializing what you want to say into this very pure, very dense, very polished prose. And one word that keeps popping up, and I'm not sure if it's apt to your writing, but I think it's interesting, is fragments and fragmented. Mm -hmm. um, to the stripped down style. Um, it makes me always think of um, the ancient Greek poet Sappho, which mm -hmm. Canadian writer Anne Carson, I know you like her too, um, has just republished a few years ago. Um, they make like beauty out of this accidental nature of the lines we have left out of Sappho because we couldn't control what's still there. And I wonder, is that something that maybe your prose tries to make out of the accidental nature of the natural world we have left. Mm, I like that. I like that idea. That's a beautiful way of saying it. Um, yes, I, I sort of feel like sometimes the word fragment feels not quite right because it suggests maybe that I'm not thinking of these individual um, parts as, as complete in and of themselves. Um, I don't like take something and break it and then put them, you know, throughout. But in terms of feeling like, like you say, that there's a kind of accidental or glancing, you know, beauty, I feel like some, some writers are really like, they want the, they want to punch you yeah. right in the head and you feel it. Whereas I'm like the glancing blow. I want you to barely know it happened, but then be like, why, <laughs> why do I have, why does my face uh, soar today? Um, so that's a, weirdly combative way to talk about writing. But I just mean in terms of the feeling of, um, I think I'm always drawn to things that are a little in the corner of my eye. And, um, you know, part of, part of that is just like reading a lot of poetry and essays and frankly, reading a lot of European fiction versus, um, versus American fiction. Um, it's, there's much more of a tradition, I feel like of these, uh, slim novels that really contain a world. Hmm. It's, it's also quite funny. Fragments doesn't really apply. Also this constant comparison of um, Twitter-like prose. Yeah. Very funny to me. First, because you tweet, uh, you, you tweet Twitter. You quit Twitter <laughs> famously three months after you joined it and never looked back. <laughs> and also, I think it it really uh, gives the impression of a kind of randomness that's absolutely not in your books. Nothing is random at all in them. And I think every reader can get the sense pretty quickly. And I think yeah. that would be- I think people are responding to uh, the combination of, of, of different tones that you find on Twitter. But I mean, Twitter by its nature is about immediacy. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm just a really slow writer. So whatever, pieces I make, um, you know, part of the editing process is time. You know, I just keep them there for a long time to see if I like them. Whereas I feel like um, when I was on Twitter <laughs> those three months, I was like, this is great. This is so much more fun and so much easier. And I get to find out right away if this is funny or interesting or, or bad. Um, but I also could see that I would never write again. <laughs> <laughs> that was my sort of immediate uh, feeling about it, as much as it's fun. We were very lucky that you quit Twitter then. And <laughs> I, think, I think this would be a perfect opportunity to um, delve a little into the book and listen to you read a bit from it. And this is very <clears throat> awful reading from weather. Okay, I'm going to read from the very beginning, um, just so you can kind of, kind of get a feel for the way it's put together. And this... Um, this begins at the library where um, Lizzie works. And this is just people coming in and out of the library. In the morning, the one who is mostly enlightened comes in. There are stages and she is in the second to last, she thinks. This stage can be described 
only by a Japanese word, bucket of black paint, it means. I spend some time pulling books for the doomed adjunct. He's been working on his dissertation for 11 years. I give him reams of copy paper, binder clips and pens. He is writing about a philosopher I have never heard of. He is minor, but instrumental, he told me. Minor, but instrumental. But last night, his wife put a piece of paper on the fridge. Is what you're doing right now making money, it said. The man in the shabby suit does not want his library fines lowered. He is pleased to contribute to our institution. The blonde girl whose nails are bitten to the quick stops by after lunch and leaves with a purse full of toilet paper. I brave a theory about vaccination and another about late capitalism. Do you ever wish you were 30 again? Asked the lonely heart engineer. No, never, I say. I tell him that old joke about going backward. We don't serve time travelers here. <laughs> a time traveler walks into the bar. On the way home, I pass the lady who sells whirling things. Sometimes when the students are really stoned, they'll buy them. No takers today, she tells me. I pick out one for my son, Eli. It's blue and white, but blurs to blue in the wind. Don't forget quarters, I remember. At the bodega, Mohan gives me a roll of them. I admire his new cat, but he tells me it just wandered in. <laughs> he will keep it though, because his wife no longer loves him. I wish you were a real shrink, my husband says. Then we'd be rich. My brother's late, and this after I took a car service, so I wouldn't be. When I finally spot Henry, he's drenched, no coat, no umbrella. He stops at the corner, gives change to the woman in the trash bag poncho. My brother told me once that he missed drugs because they made the world stop calling to him. Fair enough, I said. We were at the supermarket. All around us, things tried to announce their true nature, but their radiance was faint and fainter still beneath the terrible music. I try to get him warmed up quickly, soup, coffee. He looks good, I think, clear-eyed. The waitress makes a new pot, flirts with him. People used to stop my mother on the street. What a waste, they'd say. Eyelashes like that on a boy. <laughs> so now we have extra bread. I eat three pieces while my brother tells me a story about his Narcotics Anonymous reading meeting. A woman stood up and started ranting about antidepressants. What upset her most was that people were not disposing of them properly. They tested worms in the city sewers and found they contained high concentrations of Paxil and Prozac. When birds ate these worms, they stayed closer to home made more elaborate nests, but appeared unmotivated to mate. But were they happier, I ask? Did they get more done in a given day? <laughs> Thank you so much. So Lizzie, your protagonist uh, is a university librarian, as we've heard, a failed PhD student, a youngish mother, and also somebody who's very, very concerned with the people around her. You get the immediate sense of that at the library counter, in her private life, uh, in her family. And you have described yourself, of course, you are not the protagonist, that's obvious, um, but you have described yourself as a porous person, which I find a very interesting adjective, um, who takes in the emotions even of strangers on the subway quite um, easily and effectively. And I wonder, is this special kind of empathy more of an asset or more of a burden as an artist and as a person? And um, is the book also exploring the ends of this empathy when faced with this catastrophic future, maybe? Well, I, I, would, I would say that it's, I think, an asset as an artist and as a writer and perhaps um, uh, 
not great as a person to feel this way because it can it can mean that you um, have trouble sort of knowing uh, how much to take in of other people's problems. Um, and of course, as you get older, you're often having more and more um, little disasters to deal with on your own, um, little and big disasters. So when I talk about being porous, I, I think I just, especially when you live in a city, um, I feel like, you know, I lived in New York City for 17 years and I never got to the point where I didn't feel strange and flinch when someone uh, seemed to be in distress or asked me for money or uh, seemed like they were crying on the subway or hitting their kid. All of that still got through and it felt, um, it could feel like so overwhelming. And I think that's why people sort of harden themselves to it. Um, and I think that with um, like the various disasters that we're going through as a society. And I mean, in, a, in this book, I also write a lot about sort of encroaching fascism and what it, what it means to be afraid that history is, you know, turning that corner again. Um, I, I feel like, uh, this sort of antenna of, of people's feelings is something that tells us what's going to happen. But it also makes you the person, you know, standing on the street corner, corner screaming or ruining the dinner party. It's, it's sort of socially not acceptable mm. to be porous, I think. <laughs> well, you managed well so far, I think. <laughs> yes. Well, once I put it in a book, I think I can feel... Uh I feel more like it's contained and then I can move on to the next uh, obsession I am having. I think this is also um, throwing us back to the title of the book, which we've mentioned uh, a few times because uh, it's a short, succinct title. It's um, pretty much translated as that in German as well. Wetter just sounds a bit more Germanic, <laughs> but it's the same. Uh, it's also pretty multifaceted, I think. So we look at the weather report, of course, once very innocently, now with a more and more ominous undertone, uh, looking for signs there. We weather things uh, like our private problems, like our planet's problems. We also have this kind of emotional internal weather, of course, and Lizzie, um, the protagonist, is a perfect representation of that, I would say. Um, and as we just heard in the book, even the worms in the city sewer system are medicalized and <laughs> take antidepressants. So how do you connect the climate crisis, encroaching fascism, everything else the book deals with, uh, and mood management, if we may call it <laughs> that? Is there something that... Yes. What, what should our mood management be as these, as these things come down the pike? Um, well, I think I, I ended up choosing that title um, for the reasons that, that you're saying. And also, because at least in English, it also has um, that sense of, of whether or not you are going to do something. So mm -hmm. a sense of hesitation, whether or not you're going to act. And, um, and I really wanted to kind of, uh, there's a um, ecology philosopher, Timothy Morton. And one of the things that he says in, in one of his, early books as he says, um, hesitation is an ecological act. And I thought that was really interesting because for the first time I saw someone saying, there's a period where you don't know what you should do, but you are becoming aware mm -hmm. and you're no longer, um, you might not look at it directly, but you're no longer pretending that you don't see anything. And and I think that's an important space to acknowledge that we can be in. Um, I know that I think one of the reasons people feel so much dread and so much anxiety about the climate, which I have to have a side note here about the European and American differences. Um, so when weather came out in America, this protagonist, this narrator is consistently described as like incredibly neurotic, <laughs> um, worried about like, insane disasters um, that are not that likely to happen and and completely sort of unhinged. <laughs> and then whenever I would talk to anyone uh, for any European paper, they would be like, 
Well, she's, you know, she's quite slow to realize the severity of our situation. <laughs> it would be this completely, completely the opposite. Um, so I do feel like people are at different stages of it. And I wanted to write about someone who was really quite at the beginning of thinking about these things. Um, because often we don't know what to do at the beginning. Um, you might worry that you have to be completely pure to go forward. You know, my joke when I was writing, it was always like uh, activism for hypocrites because that's, that's where I fall and that's where most of us fall. Um, but that's what I think about the mood management that when you look more directly at something, I think things like dread and anxiety are often about um, that you're not looking directly. You just feel letting it bubble up. Mm -hmm. um, and so at least that's been my experience. I feel less doom laden since I dove into this than I did before. Hmm. So um, I wanted to encourage the audience as well to type in questions for the very end of um, this hour with Jenny Ophel. I'm going to read a few selected of them um, at the end. So you have a bit of time left. Um, I want to get to the instrument, which is part of this awareness process for Lizzie, which is her new side gig. Besides being a librarian, she um, gets to respond to emails to a very popular podcast by a former academic mentor, like this academic superstar um, who has this podcast, Hell or High Water, great name. And um, she has to respond to all kinds of people. Uh, I've mentioned it in German in the beginning, but there's panicked environmentalists obsessed with composting toilets, um, two hardcore Christians who are already <laughs> giddy for the rapture, basically. Mm -hmm. And so she sees this whole spectrum of um, American reactions to this new world of climate change that isn't in the far future, but it's here and it's changing things already. So do you think American society with its tendency to extremes, um, it's <laughs> <laughs> that come up already a bit in our chat um, is especially divided and uh, on a r wide spectrum about matters as these or are you just a few years ahead uh, of self-styled moderate countries in Europe like the Federal Republic of Germany? <laughs> <laughs> well I sometimes feel like it can be useful to uh, just because of the size of America it's like try to imagine if all of Europe had to like with the differences that they have in their cultures, um, agree on things. So it might, it might be quite strange, you know, like that, and that's the way a lot of uh, America is. Like it's very divided, different parts of the country have really different ideas. We see that with the vaccines um, and also with the climate um, kind of consciousness or interest in it. Um, we also have, and I, I don't know if you have, this so much in Germany, but we do have this whole evangelical undercurrent. And they really do believe that the rapture is coming and the believers are gonna be called up and there will be trials and tribulations for everyone left behind, but that's not really their concern. Mm -hmm. So if they, see, um, if they see floods, if they see fires, part of that is almost like an exciting sign to them like the kingdom of God is soon going to be created. Wow. And that's an incredibly hard bit of the population to work with um, because they don't, they don't really have any interest in stopping disaster. If anything, they think that the disaster is uh, the step, the next step that we need. Um, so I feel like, yes, in that way, it feels different than Europe. You know, it feels different in terms of like these kind of subterranean um, eschatological, like last days kind of ideas, um, I feel like are bigger, a bigger component um, of what keeps people from, also, you know, we're just a huge country where everybody likes to drive. <laughs> and so nobody really wants to face um, like what it would mean, you know, to, to, to give up oil. I mean, 
if you've, if you've ever visited the States, you know, that like, you're suddenly like, I guess I have to rent a car, you know, because it's, the trains aren't as uh, good or they're so expensive and things like that. So I do think that that shapes people's consciousness about environmental things um, to a large degree. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, of course, car culture is so big in America, but I think Europe gets off the hook. Uh, <laughs> you? Much. I mean, it, especially Germany is so hooked on this stuff and we can't even get a, um, a limit to how fast you can drive on the Autobahn. Uh, <laughs> That's true. You guys do have the Autobahn. <laughs> so I think it's in some ways it's just as hope, hopeless maybe. <laughs> but from the Autobahn to the Kern familia, to the core family, um, the, the domestic and emotional realms of motherhood, of marriage future, uh, feature prominently in this novel as well as the one before. And this core family, the Kernfamilie, as it's called in German, has to bear the brunt of this whole set of modern crisis, crises um, that uh, feature in the novel. So caretaking is um, the word you've already used. Um, caretaking expands to immediate relatives, but also to the brother of Lizzie, who is a former addict um, to her religious and not quite easy mother. Um, and this kind of caretaking is expected of Lizzie every day. And um, there's a sense of exhaustion, of course, as she has to draw lines. She isn't always that good <laughs> with line, drawing lines. And I'm so interested in this topic of motherhood and having a child in this context because, of course, there's two things that keep coming up. One is, what kind of world do I put my child in now? This whole talk about, can I still have children when I know the world's on fire? And we used to say 30 years, now it's like tomorrow or it's already on fire. Um, and what world will we leave them if they have to live for 80 or 90 years? Mm -hmm. people are still getting older and the second part of it which is also so tricky is that experts say the most efficient thing one person can do today to stop the climate crisis not is not having children and that's such a moral dilemma i think for humanity so um how did you think about things like that while putting together this novel about domestic life but also climate change the biggest Mm -hmm. topic of all basically well <clears throat> i i thought several times when i was writing this novel how lucky i was that i i didn't know these facts before i had a child of course i knew um about climate change but the scale of it and how soon it was happening mm -hmm. um was still talked about as like a problem for your great grandchildren um and that's of course uh sped up you know enormously um and the calculations have shown that it's much sooner. I started to notice about eight years ago that my students, my college students would sometimes uh, almost passingly allude to the fact that well, they probably couldn't have kids because of how terrible the world would be. And I really thought to myself, wow, this is at the time, you know, my daughter was little. It was one of the impetuses to write this book because I thought, what does it mean to grow up knowing this? And I think we're seeing it. Um, people were so surprised, at least in America, a lot of people were surprised at the sort of anger that comes out in some of the youth climate movements or the Greta Thunberg. But I was like, I'm not surprised. That's been there a long time, but nobody notices it unless you're in the movement. Um, and I think that I also noticed just anecdotally that some of those, the most extreme climate doomers I know, meaning that they do not have a lot of hope for how we're gonna come out of it, that they all ended up having one child, <laughs> uh -huh. um, but they did have a child. And I, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, not everyone, of course, but, um, but people that surprised me, well, I'll put it that way. And I think it's because just like people have babies during, you know, wartime or during other things that chance to feel that kind of joy and connection and that sort of thing. And I 
I guess the part of me that is optimistic hopes that if people are having children, it will mean that they have, uh, we, we have an expression, some skin in the game that you realize like, yes, you might not be here for this, the worst of this, but they are going to be. So what does that mean for you? Because like at COP26, when they're making these claims that in 2070, you know, we'll decarbonize, the average age of the people there is 60. You know, none of those people are gonna be here. <laughs> but if, if you do think not only of your moment in time, but of, the, of your, your child or your niece or your nephew or just someone that's younger that you care about, I'd like to think that that can be something that allows us to find those interconnections and find that ability to adapt and build communities that can work better. I mean, I see it with the young people I know, they're very thoughtful about it, about intentional families. And mm. um, so I think that there's, I think despair in some ways is, is understandable, but maybe not completely warranted. Uh, interesting. Um, because I wanted to um, come back to politics for a second. Um, and of course, what also features prominently in uh, the novel, and you've already uh, talked about the encroaching sense of fascism, is the 2016 election, uh, now long past gone. We had another since then. Um, and of course, we all experienced the years to follow. It's a central thing in Lizzie's life too. And um, of course, the Trump administration was pretty harsh on the climate and had pretty radical policies there, which weren't as prominent as some of the other stuff they did, of course. Um, but at the same time, now, if I may call them that, the good guys are back in, at least from the European sense, and still there's still no nothing. real sense of, yeah, of, of a big breakthrough. And the same thing actually just happened here in Germany where the Greens are back in government, they hope to, um, they hope to have the first green chancellor. It didn't work out like that, but they're the second biggest party in the new coalition. And still they're the losers of the um, coalition talks now. And what we'll have is pretty disappointing, um, I would predict. And so I wonder, um, is your recipe swearing off giving too much hope into politics and just putting it back into grassroots movements? Or what is your way of dealing with it? I mean, I think the frustrating answer is we have to do both. I mean, I, I am so disenchanted right now with, uh, you know, my own Democratic Party and their inability to fight back with the obstruction that the, the Republican um, Party has done, even though we're, you know, ostensibly in power. I do think that it's the sense that, you know, we, and maybe the Greens are doing this too, that we're always bringing a knife to a gunfight, you know, it feels really strong that if you have one side <laughs> that will stop at nothing and, and that, that will, doesn't feel constrained by the truth and doesn't feel constrained by um, any kind of sense of like, what is an honorable way to deal with or not deal with, then the, it's very hard to fight. And Biden, for better or for worse, is just, he is of another era mm -hmm. when there used to be um, a little bit more of a cross, cr crossing lines and it wasn't quite as polarized. So you might have a moderate Republican um, who would say, yeah, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the climate, you know, we, or the Republicans who, who are that way now are being sort of pushed out of the, par the party. Mm. Um, and so I think that it, politics always seems like the result is so slow, so disappointing. And yet, if we hadn't gotten out the vote for Biden, uh, I mean, things would be immeasurably worse. And frankly, I'm quite concerned uh, about what was gonna happen at our next election. So. Again, I think the all or nothing of, of if something will work or not. Lots of people in history have had to fight battles where they don't get to see if it turns out okay. <laughs> yeah. And I, I feel like we're in, this, we're in this position where like it might not work, but 
but just doing nothing also feels like, um, for me at least, like an, an abdication of some kind of responsibility. Mm. So before I, I give you one or two audience questions, we can end on something a little lighter. Um, <laughs> sure. Because what's in the book is um, something that's in the book is called the uh, obligatory note of hope. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the story, it's like a sardonic label for what pod the podcaster Sylvia, um, we haven't talked too much about her, but she's quite a presence in the book, the famous academic, uh, feels she has to include in every article, every speech about the climate crisis she's giving, if she wants to keep her audience. I think that's already pointing to uh, how much you're thinking about the psych ecological effect of this um, and how difficult it is to get people engaged. And after the end of the book, the phrase reappears as an URL uh, and directs reader, uh, the reader, the readers to a real existing website that you've put up <laughs> that reaches beyond the novel and offers basically resources for green activism. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering what your idea behind this was, beside the obvious good causes you um, promote there and um, what you yourself are doing to keep up the spirit in this fight that we might not see the end of. In our right. Um, well, the reason I put it at the end of the book after, you know, what I think of as the, you know, the actual ending is I think that we shouldn't like force people to be hopeful. I think that like the obligatory um, note of hope that gets tacked on every environmental article. We've all seen it where it's like, you know, so dark what they're saying. And then at the end, they just make some crazy thing. Like if we all turn it around in these crazy amount of time, like, oh, it'll be fine. And we'll do it. And I think it's very, for me, at least it's very alienating that false note at the end of things. And so I guess with the website, I wanted to do uh, I wanted to say, okay, here's a couple ways that you can get involved if that's what you're about. But I also have a section that's called tips for trying times yeah. where it's all things that I've quoted from other writers or speakers. And, and one of the things I read a lot about was like the siege of Sarajevo. Mm. So how did people survive that? You know, it went on for so long. And, and some of the things I read surprised me because some of the things in the oral histories were like, it's really important to still give gifts. <laughs> like even in times of incredible scarcity, yeah. like it, it's, it, you give a little thing and that's one of the things that makes us feel human. Um, and so I wanted to kind of combine that. I don't think everyone's role is to be an activist and chain themselves to a bridge. Um, I am increasingly seeing that my role feels like it's about teaching, like mm -hmm. a, that I'm teaching classes that I'm about to teach a class called Beyond Dread, <laughs> writing about climate. Now, it doesn't mean there's going to be no dread. <laughs> I'm just thinking like, what else is there? Let's, let's talk about this and talk about like in terms of writing, like how we go somewhere. So I feel like it, I didn't want people to have to go, go there if they didn't want to. <laughs> I wanted you to be able to stay in just the novel. And that's why it's a, 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 a an add-on. On the subject of websites, before I um, reach, reach you the first audience question, um, and we'll come to a close and also to a last little piece of weather in the end, um, I've noticed that you put up, I think it's called Half a Library um, for your previous novel for the Department of Speculation with all the texts and, bo and books that influenced you there. And I think um, there's not half a library yet for weather. <laughs> no, I should do that. But um, could you maybe tell us a few of the books that um, inspired you, brought you on the way to this book and that the audience might like to read after yours? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I read a lot of nonfiction for this book, um, perhaps like more than I read fiction. Um, so one book that was really important to me was this book about, it's a sociology book called States of Denial, Looking Away from Suffering and Atrocity. And it introduced this idea to me of twilight knowing, which is kind of what I was talking before, where you, something, you're half aware of something. And um, it's by Stanley Cohen. He talked about it in terms of like, people living through the apartheid era or, um, or during the Holocaust. But, 
but it also has been um, taken over by some climate people as something that's going on there. Um, I also read a book by um, Krista Wolf <laughs> um, that was useful to me that was called um, Accident, mm -hmm. which was about Chernobyl um, and, and what it was like in that moment. Um, and, and in the book, um, the narrator also, I think it's her brother or her husband, I can't remember, who's having surgery, brain surgery. And so the way that those two things um, existed, I sort of found that halfway through. And I thought that that was really useful. Um, and then I, um, I really like this American writer, Joy Williams, who has always written these very dark, but really interesting um, environmentally tinged books. And so the most recent one, I think, was 99 stories about God. Wow. And um, I quote, I quote one of them, because they're little, almost tiny little pieces. I quote one of them in, in Tips for Trying Times. Mm -hmm. So you, you can get a little taste of it if you're curious. <laughs> but yeah, I should make a half a library. Yeah, please do. It's also so funny that American writers keep mentioning Krista Wolf to me. Like she's one of my favorite writers, but she's oh. unfashionable in Germany. And Americans yeah. seem to like her so much. Maybe there's a renaissance going on. <laughs> you know, it was quite hard to find the book. You know, I just was, um, I was thinking about like, are there any short books about disaster? <laughs> that was kind of, I think, how I stumbled upon it. That's so funny. So um, one question from the chat. Um, asks, you called your novel weather and not climate. How cheeky did you, did you mean to be about that? I think it's clima in Spanish though, I saw somewhere. Yeah, there was a lot of different debates in the translation about like what people wanted to, to call it. Um, well, the reason I called it weather um, is actually there's a, there's a passage um, in the book. I'll actually, maybe I can find it quickly. Um, It's about when she first starts going around with um, Sylvia and she's listening to the environmental talks and they're talking about the glaciers and Lizzie notes how angry it makes people to hear about the glaciers. And this man stands up and he says, all right, I've heard all about that. I've heard about the glaciers. What's going to happen to the American weather? <laughs> and to me, it just feels like that is a particularly uh, American idea that there's some weather that is only ours, that does not, does not go anywhere else. And so I did want it to be slightly um, too localized, you know, right? I wanted that to be part of what, and we're also all caught up in our own emotional weather. So I did want, I did want it to be the smaller word, um, but I, I lost the battle with some, um, <laughs> with some translators. <laughs> more variation is also maybe good yeah there's there's weather report i think is a is a good you know there's there's different nuances that work yeah um if i may read you uh one final audience question from hannah lu who asked um you talked about teaching and that teaching is a good way to get people to live in a sustainable way do you want to teach Do you want to teach with your novel? Oh, now I get the grammar. And therefore include spe specific facts that you want people to know about. So is it an instrument mm. of teaching? I mean, I do not think of novels particularly as an instructive medium. Mm. Um, I think that um, for me, they're just too idiosyncratic. That said, I personally love to pick up little strange things in a novel, um, any kind of you know, insight into a world that I don't know about. So I would say that I sort of, I, I, I squirrel in a lot of nonfiction ideas, mm -hmm. but in terms of what I want people to learn, I just don't think of it that way because I feel like um, you don't have to learn anything. <laughs> you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to read it. I was once on an uh, American TV show and they, they hadn't read the book or anything, but they, they said, what's your, What would you say the takeaway for this book is for the reader? And I was like, oh, oh, there's no takeaway. And they were like, no, what's the takeaway? And I was like, oh, I don't know. And they were like, why should they read it? And I said, well, they definitely don't have to read this book. No, <laughs> you know, so, so I'm not, um, I'm, I guess I'm not, I don't think of it in a pedagogical way, but I hope that through my own kind of learning things, that maybe it opens up an interesting space to kind of have a conversation within a book. 
<laughs> I once attended a German reading where at the end um, an older lady um, stood up and uh, told the quite famous German author that um, his presentation hadn't satisfied uh, her to a degree and that he should give her three bullet points why she should buy the book. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm glad it doesn't only happen to me then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you, you would be witty enough to reply to that. So um, if I may ask you for one final um, little bit of weather. Um, yeah. And then I, I could say um, everybody. I, we talked a little bit about how the main character starts working for her former um, academic advisor. And that's Sylvia, who is sort of a longtime activist. So I'm just going to read a little uh, section where she first um, hears Sylvia lecture. I'm late for the lecture now, and I was wrong about which building it's in. By the time I get there, Sylvia is almost through speaking. There's a big crowd. Behind her is a graph shaped like a hockey stick. What it means to be a good person, a moral person, is calculated differently in times of crisis than in ordinary circumstances, she says. She pulls up a slide of people having a picnic by a lake. Blue skies, green trees, white people. Suppose you go with these friends to the park to have a picnic. This act is, of course, morally neutral. But if you witness a group of children drowning in the lake and you continue to eat and chat, you have become monstrous. The moderator makes a gesture to show it is time to wrap up. A line of men is forming behind the microphone. I have both a question and a comment, <laughs> they say. A young woman stands up to wait in line. I watch as she inches forward. Finally, she makes it to the front to ask her question. How do you maintain your optimism? I can't even get to Sylvia afterward. There are too many people. I walk back to the subway, trying to think about the world. Young person worry. What if nothing I do matters? Old person worry. What if everything I do does? Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, a little bit of information for the local people at the very end. There's somebody applauding at least as an emoji. That's, that's very nice. <laughs> that's so weird that nobody can applaud at online readings. I cannot. <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> so unfair. Uh, it's not several people. Okay. Um, so who's in town actually can come to our exhibition opening on Friday where there's live sketching. Um, there's another Transatlantic Tuesday coming up with uh, a diagnosis with the famous historian who's um, talking about reinventing the terms of genocide, a very serious topic. <laughs> and because we've talked about a podcast, I also want to mention our podcast. It's not <laughs> called Hell or High Water, but, but Carl and Company. You can um, listen to it at every um, platform there is, basically. And we've ha we have an episode with the famous Irish author Colm Tobin coming up. So um, check that out. And with that, I want to thank all of you for coming, for uh, visiting our digital Transatlantic Tuesday tonight. And most of all, it's been a great honor and a great joy to talk to Jenny Ophel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you all for coming. And with that, uh, good night and have a lovely evening. Good Goodbye. Night.